It's, uh, it's really nice to see so many people in the audience. And thank you very much to Matt for, for introducing um, this conversation. So I'm so thrilled um, to be here with the wonderful um, former Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, uh, Michelle Florinoy. And we are really here to um, kind of kick off the discussion, um, provide a little bit of strategic context, the so what of why we're here. Why, why are we here talking about um, autonomous systems, AI, emerging technology, in the context of, of defense and security um, in particular. So Michelle, at today's conference, um, we'll be talking a lot about autonomous systems, their value, um, operational use cases, but I, I really wanted to start by taking a step back um, and reflecting on the so what. So um, what is the importance of emerging technology for strategic competition between the US and its adversaries? Um, how decisive is this technology really in that context? And why does the United States need to stay ahead in terms of developing new technology like autonomous systems and AI? Well, first of all, thanks to uh, Applied Intuition and the Atlantic Council for hosting us, and thanks to all of you for coming out for this discussion. I think it is one of the most important discussions we should be having in the national security space. So, um, you know, as, as Clem mentioned, we are in a new period of strategic competition, particularly with a rising China that is, um, I think, bent under President Xi on challenging some of the inherited rules-based order on uh, reordering aspects of the Asia-Pacific region. And given that that region is probably the most important to us in terms of economic prosperity, our security long-term, um, this is an area where we really have to pay attention. And one of the key areas of advantage historically we've had is a technological edge in a whole host of technologies that have enabled us to have a military edge, part of what's enabled us to have a military edge. We also have the best people in the world in our armed forces. But um, it's also you know, had huge economic benefits for us. So when you look at the, um, you know, we're in this period where the geopolitical chessboard, if you will, is being reshaped. I think towards a much more multipolar world, but we're also at the same time in this period of profound technological disruption. And so the technologies that gave us the edge in the past are not the technologies that are gonna give us the edge in the future. And the new technologies require a different set of behaviors because, and I know we'll talk more about this, but it used to be, you know, many of the older folks with gray hair in the audience, <laughs> we all remember that you know, the Defense Department's R&D program really drove a lot of innovation that then spun out into the commercial world. Now it's almost much of it. I'm not saying there's no defense innovation, there is. But there's also, the, I think the really most significant cutting edge innovation that's happening is in the commercial space. And so you have a fundamentally different problem for the Department of Defense, for the intelligence community, for others in the national security space. Uh, and that is how do you integrate, how do you adopt that innovation with speed and at scale? And that's where we are still um, struggling. So if we take our feet off the gas, if we, if we don't figure out how to keep an edge in, in technology, a whole host of technologies, including AI and autonomy, um, you know, we will, I think it will hurt us economically, it will hurt us in terms of our inf influence around the world and the ability to shape things, and it will certainly hurt our, the ability to uh, count on our military to first and foremost deter conflict, and if necessary, fight and prevail. So, just picking up on that, that last point, um, autonomous systems and AI are, are likely to play key roles in the future of warfare. Um, you know, they already are in some ways, but I think the potential, we, we don't know where things, where, where things will go. Um, but obviously the, the widespread applicability of these systems, the many different um, functions that autonomy and, and artificial intelligence can really um, augment, it is gonna be pretty important. Um, and, and they obviously allow existing platforms to operate with decreasing levels of human interaction, for extended periods and, and increasingly deadly environments, which I think is perhaps changing some of the, the traditional constructs of the way we think about um, the operational concepts of, for using this type of um, this technology. So what are or, or should be US priorities in developing this tech for defense and security purposes? 
And what do you think um, are the legal and ethical considerations that we should keep front of mind? Right. Um, so I do think the first task, and it is something the department has been taking seriously, is developing a policy framework that sets some guardrails on what is acceptable application of this technology and what is what is not. I think the existing or the re you know revised um, DOD policy is pretty pretty good, but it needs to evolve. It also needs to be worked with our allies, so we're on the same page. Um, and it also needs to be pressure tested in light of the fact that our adversaries, or potential adversaries, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, they're not gonna be constrained by the same ethical code. Um, so that's, that's thing one. Thing two is really working on um, the explainability, the safety, the security of the AI um, systems that we develop. And again, that's um, a high bar and there's a lot of work um, going on there. Um, I'm One of my other hats is chairing CNAS and we're just about to start a multi-year um, effort on exactly that issue. Um, but in terms of how, how things get, you know, where the, the key near-term applications are, I think what I'm seeing first and foremost is in the intelligence and indications and warning space. So we have, you know, just massive amounts of, of information coming in at multiple levels, some open source, secret, top secret, what have you. And I'm starting to see, um, particularly out at the, at the COCOM level, um, some early adoption of AI systems that can sort through all of that and come up with predictive intelligence. I'll give you one example that I'm pretty sure is now unclassified, I hope it is. <laughs> it was reported in the press. So um, was a, there was a recently some Chinese operations, proximity operations in space, where they sort of send a, a satellite to come up close and look at one of ours. Historically, we've been able to sort of guess that it might be happening a few days before the actual event. They had, using this AI system, they, have had, they had 55 days of warning, uh, looking at patterns of behavior in past operations. That's a huge advantage for decision makers, right? So that's the first thing. Use AI, application of AI for, uh, to support decision maker advantage primarily in the intel space. The second one is, um, I think as we, we seek to build a network of networks, whether you call it JADC2 or any of the other service names for this, but this notion of a, an agile, responsive C4 ISR system that can sustain operations and coherence while under attack. Um, I think the, there's going to have to be um, uh, some use of AI to enable that to be a intelligent system of systems, almost like the electrical grid, where you know something goes down, a node goes down, and you know the the system immediately reroutes the traffic to other systems that are still functioning. But that's going to have to happen at great speed in real time, and so forth. Again, if we can do that and our adversaries can't, gives us huge decision-making advantage. And the third example I'll give you um, that I think is coming in the near term is human-machine teaming. So enabling a single operator, whether they're flying a, you know, an air, you know, a fighter jet or on a ship or in a submarine to control swarms of unmanned systems that will greatly complicate an adversary's planning, defenses, everything else, and in a, in a theater like Asia Pacific, where we're gonna always be at a disadvantage quantitatively in terms of mass, it's a way to buy back you know, mass and, and, and numbers uh, that would be extremely helpful to the warfighter. And timing, right? Um, so that, that, was, that was really helpful. I wanna transition over to talking a little bit about China. Um, so China has made its strategic commitment to AI and an intelligent warfare or intelli intelligentized warfare um, very clear, including in um, President Xi's address to the 20th Party Congress last year. Um, 
But how the PLA intends to integrate AI and how um, it may shape China's operational concepts is still pretty opaque to mm -hmm. us, um, at least in, in, in public spaces. So what are the campaign or strategic level outcomes that you think this type of technology might enable? And what really most concerns you about um, China's development of autonomous systems and what that might mean in certain operational environments that, that outcomes for that that the Chinese are trying to achieve or that we're trying to achieve. Well, that that they are trying to achieve, mm -hmm. but how that might kind of complicate what, what our response may be. Yeah, um, you know, again, we don't. Well, I I'll say I don't know a lot about what they're actually doing um, and how far along they are in specific defense applications, so I'm, I am speculating. But I think that they are going to be using um, their own efforts to, um, to, to create a more speed of response. Um, I think first in the areas of, of air and missile defense, um, you know, I think it's a lot easier to accept a higher level of autonomy in defensive applications than it is in offensive applications, mm -hmm. even for the Chinese, which who may have, you know, greater appetite on the offensive side as well. So I think that we can certainly expect that. What an interesting question that I really don't know the answer to, so maybe some of you in the Intel space can dig into this, is um, how, will they use AI to speed their own decision making if it runs counter to the sort of the integration at every level of party control and this very hierarchical, very um, controlled approach. It, this is not a military that does what we do and which makes us so offensive, which is they, they empower down. You know, they give clear commander's intent, they set some rules of engagement, we set some rules of engagement and then off you go, you do the mission. If things change on the ground, you know, if you can communicate and ask for guidance, great. If otherwise you're, you know, you're executing the mission as you understand it. Um, the Chinese have a much tighter rein on, on command and control, and that may become an impediment to some of the um, agility that I think AI can bring and resiliency that AI can bring in a more networked and dispersed kind of um, situation. Um, but I, the thing I worry about is will they have less sort of a moral constraint or ethical um, constraint on the use of um, full auto fully autonomous systems for offensive operations. And again, we just, you know, there's a lot of speculation on this, but we just don't know. Yeah. Um, I do, I'm hoping to, to take some audience questions. So um, there is a QR code that you can use to submit, um, submit some audience questions. I think, there it is. <laughs> if you want to point your phones up to the, to the screen, I think they'll keep that QR code up there for a little bit. Um, so, uh, they will come directly to me, and I will try and pose some if we have time. Um, so, Michelle, you've argued that the U.S. should help Taiwan um, create a porcupine defense strategy, right, which is the idea of uh, improving its resilience um, to kind of slow down and improve costs on, on a potential ag aggressor. Um, and to aid in this, the, the, the U.S. Has, has provided Taiwan with both harpoon and, and side window missiles, but, you know, there's more to come. This is only the first step. So how do you see AI and autonomous technologies, including small drones, assisting in Taiwan's ability to defend itself? Um, and how can the Pentagon accelerate the early adoption of, of dual-use commercial technologies to help not just US war, war fighters, but also our allies and our partners? Yeah, well, I think um, you know, when we talk about a porcupine strategy, it's really trying to make Taiwan less digestible to a superior, to a superior conventional force um, and really to buy time. That is that is the name of the game. To, you know, Taiwan by itself, I don't think can either deter or prevail against um, China, but it can defend itself much more effectively um, in a way that really complicates things and slows things down for China, allowing the US and the international community to respond in that scenario. Um, so I do think um, using uh, swarms of drones um, in multiple domains could be very effective, both for ISR, for communication relays, for kinetic operations. 
Um, and and the good news is that I think there's you know the, a potential not to have to rely on the un, unfortunately too often too slow uh, cumbersome FMS foreign military sales process and to go out on the commercial market to buy some of these things and then adapt them to different military missions. Um, and you know the good news is you know Taiwan has a pretty technologically savvy workforce, and I'm sure this is absolutely in their capability to do with a little bit of advice and guidance. So I would hope that they would they would pursue their own commercial adoption strategy in that in that area. So unmanned systems of, of all types um, are rapidly becoming more numerous and, and more capable and, and cheaper, right? Um, and the war in Ukraine, I think we've seen, it's the first large scale conflict in, in which um, widespread use of drones has been used on, on both sides, um, which has really allowed us, I think, to see some experimentation and a refinement of, of tactics using this type of technology. Um, so, so what lessons do you think can be drawn from the conflict in Ukraine for the future use of autonomous systems in warfare? And are such lessons applicable to other scenarios? Um, absolutely. I mean, I think we've seen them, seen drones being used for both tactical and higher level um, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Um, we've seen them used as, um, you know, delivery systems for kinetic munitions. Um, we've seen that at short range, medium range, um, more recently at long range. Um, so I think... Um, this is an area, this is a, it is a new era and we should expect to see this in, you know, most conflicts going forward. It is a commercially pervasive system and with some adaptation, you know, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a relatively low bar for countries to figure out how to use these. Um, um, I just, I did want to say one more thing about the Taiwan scenario if I could. Um, you know, we have been thinking about this on a much longer time frame than I think is now um, of concern. Um, so, you know, the, the Chinese Com Communist Party has long talked about on their 100th year anniversary, 2049, um, we'll have one China. You know, Hong Kong will be back, Taiwan will be back. But it was sort of a long-term slow burn aspiration. What's different about um, President Xi is that he talks about a different time frame. He talks about resolving this on his watch. Now, maybe that's his third term, maybe he has a fourth term, but he wants to have this as part of his legacy. Um, and while I do think that he still prefers a non-military approach to the reunification of Taiwan, um, he, you know, he'll be using Political coercion, you know, watch China carefully in terms of their attempts to influence the upcoming uh, elections in Taiwan in early 24. They will use uh, economic development, try to create so many ties between Taiwan and the mainland that there's a dependency in a sense that, you know, Taiwan can't um, sort of steer its own path and then shrink Taiwan's international space, get countries to break off relations with Taiwan and only have relations with China. Um, so, you know, I, I always, I joke that this is, a, it's not a joke, but it's, it, it makes, it reminds me of the Star Trek absorption into the Borg. That's, that's actually Beijing's preferred model. If you're a Star Trek fan, good for you. If you haven't watched it, watch that, that, that particular episode. But it is really about, you know, forced absorption. Um, that said, I think if he gets to the point where he feels frustrated, where he sees that the U.S. is only becoming more and more capable, better and better postured in the 2030s, there is a window um, where he might be tempted to use force. We've seen that rehearsed now twice in recent times, first in response to the Pelosi visit, second after the uh, McCarthy meeting um, in California, and basically rehearsing a blockade, which could be either a standalone operation or, or, or a step into invasion. And we, lastly, we know that he's ordered his military to accelerate a number of critical programs to be ready by 2027. 
So it's that, that's what's gotten this sense of urgency that we, we need to get Taiwan's defenses in better order. We need to get ourselves better postured. We need to rally our allies. We need to focus on using what we have in hand in new operational concepts to get a higher level of deterrence outcome in the next five years. Well, that's a helpful and stark reminder, I think, of, of the, the urgency of, of some of the issues that, that we're talking about. Um, and you heard it here first, folks, watch Star Trek. Um, so on a related point in terms of um, the pace at which we're able to adopt some of the, the great innovations that are happening um, ac across the, the private sector, you serve as um, a commissioner on the Atlantic Council's uh, Commission on Defense Innovation Adoption, and um, Applied Intuition is also a kind of member of that grouping um, of different companies. and former government officials who really care about um, accelerating the rapid adoption of, of promising commercial technologies. Um, and we've just released a set of recommendations on, on how to do that, um, some low-hanging fruit. And so while the private sector is innovating at pace, the, the Department of Defense still really struggles uh, to scale the fielding of, of new, new capabilities in timeframes that are actually relevant to mm -hmm. the pace in which technology is, is developing. Um, and, and you've previously defined success um, not as the number of experiments and demonstrations of, of that technology, but at the speed in which new capabilities are put in the hands of US mm -hmm. warfighters. Um, can you elaborate on, on that? Sure. Um, where can DOD Im improve or streamline um, some of its processes for effective innovation adoption? Um, and how do you think uh, improved organization will translate into um, military advantage? Yeah. So, I mean, I do want to be fair, and I think the department has, um, it, you know, focused on this issue. Actually, the Armed Services Committees in Congress have focused on this issue, given the department a lot of new and more flexible authorities, some of which were mentioned in the introduction that are now being used more. Um, but, you know, we still are not where we need to be. So I think the department has gotten much better at scouting, finding technologies that can help solve tough and, you know, priority problems. I think they've gotten much better at getting the, um, those technology companies into demonstration, prototyping, experimentation type of exercises to show what they've got and to, to start, you know, tweaking it to specific mission requirements. Um, where we're still struggling is taking that successful prototype that some number of customers want, you know, in the DOD and getting it into full-scale production and actually feel it, fielding to the warfighter. So uh, I was having a conversation with one of the service chiefs a couple nights ago, and he was saying, if I want to have a capability start production in the 26 Palm, I have to have it proposed and approved by this summer. We're in 2023, and if you want to start production in 2026, that is the normal cycle. That will not work for commercial entities that, you know, venture, a lot of these firms are venture-backed. You know, if you go to your <laughs> investor and say, well, I've just won this great contest, and, you know, they, a service wants to buy me at scale, buy my product at scale, but it's going to take two to two and a half years. So they're like, okay, let's forget about defense and focus on your commercial business. Um, so we have got to find ways of bridging that valley of death. Um, uh, so I think one of the things, we do have some authorities that can do that. We have not adequately trained or incented the parts of the acquisition force to know how to use them to take uh, a higher risk to use them and to be rewarded you know, and, and promoted when they use them. So there's a human capital piece in the acquisition core that has to be properly trained and incented. Um, but in addition, I do think there are probably not only additional authorities, but some additional funding that's required to transition. So there should be funding, available bridge funding, that enables a, you know, a prototype that uh, you know, has a customer that wants to buy it, to keep that in iterating development and getting closer to production ready in that time frame between when you win the, you know, the demonstration and, and when you can actually go into the palm. 
Um, so, and then I also think increasingly um, at the COCOM level, you know, the COCOMs don't have any budget really for, and certainly not for procurement, but they have unique needs that are just not going to make the service priority list. You know, some of these, you know, AI enabled intelligence and warning systems that are providing huge value to the COCOMs, there's no funding for it. They're like scraping together pennies and, and, and trying to expand pilots. But, you know, and, and whether you create, you give the new chief data officer at the Pentagon a, a cross COCOM funding stream to, do, to provide funding for AI applications for COCOMs, I think that's the most efficient way to do it rather than have each COCOM try to manage this. But we really need to look specifically at, you know, what are the, where are the choke points, where are the problems, what's going to prevent us from doing the work we need to do in the next five to ten years on adoption, and rigorously go after them, um, not just with new authorities, but with actual appropriations. Um, so we've got some great audience questions coming in. Keep them coming. Um, so we have some um, a couple of questions really related to capability development with allies, um, which is a really important question here. Um, and you've spoken a lot, mm -hmm. um, of course, about the importance of regional partnerships for deterrence and, and working closely with allies and partners on you know, technology development is a really important element to that. And we've seen frameworks like AUKUS um, really, I think, it's one, one, but uh, try and spur advanced capability development between mm -hmm. the U.S. And, and some of its closest allies. Um, so we've got some questions, and I think I'll try and pull them together. But in what areas can allies complement U.S. military efforts, and where are we seeing potential capability gaps? Um, and in your opinion, what are some of the implications that develop, the development of autonomous systems have on defense cooperation with allied nations? and how will this impact um, US security policy over the next four years? Yeah. Well, I would love to see um, the department um, put together some thinking on what I would call technology clusters. You know, if you take, you know, AI, you know, you can look across our allies and partners and say, where is their cutting edge work being done? And try to pull that group together to say, how can we collaborate in terms of accelerating, you know, adoption of some of these um, applications for defense. Um, I think, you know, in quantum, it might be a different cluster. In hypersonics, it would be a different cluster. But I think, I think that it's a use, it, it, I don't know that we're going to have, it's too unwieldy to try to work with all allies, allies on everything. So I'm, you know, I think having some definition about where to start um, based on their industrial base, their technology um, development, their own s and programs and so forth. I think that's a useful construct. Um, you know, one of the challenges here is the, we've got to evolve our, our, it's not so much policy is there, but the regulatory frameworks that allow the sharing of technology, technological information back and forth with our closest allies. I spent a lot of time working on the defense trade treaty with UK and the defense treaty with Australia, and we actually thought we'd solve the problems. Well, guess what? <laughs> it, we haven't solved the problems, and they're coming up in AUKUS. You know, AUKUS has two pillars, the submarine, nuclear submarines pillar, and then the emerging technologies pillar. And as we, in both cases, there are issues, you know, related to ITAR, related to tech trade, that are coming, export controls, that are, they're coming up even though we thought we had a, a treaty framework that solved all this. So we've got to have some evolution on the re regulatory side to enable the kind of free flow of information. I think it'll be easiest to start with Five Eyes because there's so much trust and so much um, habit. Uh, people are used to sharing the most sensitive information, at least on the Intel side. Can we? port that over to working with sensitive technologies alongside. But this is a, this is a key area for, for AUKUS and for people like Abe, Abe Denmark in the, in, the, uh, in the Department of Defense to, to be working on. And so we've got some other questions. I'm sorry, I don't know who has submitted them. I don't have names, so I'm just, these are nameless questions. But okay. um, 
In domains where rules of engagement are gray, such as space and, and cyber, how does autonomy influence the risk of unintended escalation? Well, this is the, the, the risk that is with autonomy, you know, anywhere it's applied. Um, so I think we have to be, um, we have to be very careful. Again, I, particularly in the offensive application, uh, in offensive application of force. Um, uh, so, you know, I, this is, um, I think, you know, using AI for indications and warning for mo more robust command and control, um, I think that's where we'll, we'll start getting to the point of actually automating operations that could become or be deemed offensive. Um, certainly in space, I think that's a, a bridge we'll do a lot of thinking about before we cross it. In cyber, it's a little bit different because the, the, the speed of operations in cyber is beyond sometimes, you know, sort of human capacity to be effective. So there, I think it's it's more evolving more in the direction of how do we, you know, pre-identify particular targets, particular rules of engagement, particular guardrails, uh, and enable autonomous activity, but within certain constraints. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, but it's yeah. I I think it's a. I would love to. I think we we need a, a some technologists on the stage to really unpack. One of the things I experienced over and over again when I was undersecretary is the gap between how policymakers talk about technology and how the technologists explain how these things ab absolutely work. I mean, I can't count the how many situation room meetings where you know when cyber was first being actively used as a tool at the you know level that required White House approvals, and having a lot of people at the taber, by, table table you know, who, who were using kind of nuclear escalation mo and deterrence models as their frame of reference for cyber, and I was like, oh boy, <laughs> this, is, this is not the right, the right frame, but it took, and you know, we almost needed a series of cyber 101 kind of tutorials for the policy people to really understand, and then also for the cyber people to understand the policy concerns and constraints and how to translate those into actual operational guidelines. So that gets to my final question, because we're about to run out of time. Um, there's a really important human capital element yes. to everything that we're talking about, to the adoption of this, this technology in terms of developing trust, defining roles between humans, machines, humans on the loop, humans in the loop. Um, and, and this year marks the 50th anniversary of the all-volunteer force, um, which gives us an opportunity, I think, to really think about the future force that, that we're trying to build. So as, as we increasingly look to adopt autonomous systems, how might this impact the way DOD and the services go about recruitment and about training? I think we really have to build the technical competency in our human capital, both on the civilian side and the military side. We need to be recruiting people with that, not only recruiting people, but actually creating, them a, vi creating a viable career path for someone to come in as a technologist and to have that be their specialty and to have a career and promotion opportunities, uh, leadership opportunities with, with that kind of background. Right now we bring in some of those people and then we tell them, oh, you've got to leave your tech specialty and you know go to a squadron or go to a battalion or go to a unit somewhere to kind of check the box so you can get promoted in, your, in the kind of conventional sense. Um, I also think we need to create, you know, right now it's like a soda straw of exchange programs where you bring technical people into the department for a while and, and vice and department people out to tech companies to learn and, you know, just develop. That needs to be a super highway, super highway, not a, not a soda straw. So there's, there's a lot. The human capital piece is foundational. Um, and we've got to better recruit, better employ, you know, our technical talent uh, and to retain them, and then also find ways of bringing outside talent in on a much more regular basis and at scale. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. Sure. You've given us a lot of food for thought, I think, for today's sets of, of discussions. I so appreciate your time, and thank you so much to the audience um, for your engagement and questions. Great. And we'll pass it on to Thank you. Have a good conference. Yeah. yeah.